The Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver post game is probably the most popular one out of any Pokemon game, as it's the only post game where you can explore a whole region, defeat 8 gym leaders, and even challenge one of the toughest Pokemon trainers to ever live. But I guarantee there's at least one Pokemon player that has never set foot into the Kanto region after defeating Lance. So today, I'll be continuing my long-running series on the channel by checking out what all there is to do after becoming the champion in the Johto remakes and exploring every nook and cranny that even more experienced players might have missed. I'll be using the same game file that I used in my Inventing a New Pokemon Nuzlocke video, so be sure to check that one out once you're done here. Anyways, without further ado, it's time to actually play through the post game of Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. So after defeating Lance and becoming the champion, the first order of business was to grab the SS ticket from Professor Elm. This allowed us to board the SS Aqua, but in the Olivine City dock, Professor Oak upgraded our Pokedex to the National Mode. On the boat, a little girl was bothering the captain, so we had to play hide and seek with her. Once she was found, the ship arrived in Vermilion City. Right after exiting the SS Aqua, Suicune made a brief appearance before running away. The only thing to do in Vermilion right now was take on a Lieutenant Surge. Just in case you didn't know, in the Johto post games, you can battle the gym leaders in any order you'd like. For this video, I'll probably take it city by city and just fight the gym leader whenever I'm there. Anyways, thanks to the Snorlax blocking Diglett's cave, we ventured north through Route 6, which led us to Saffron City. In the Sylph Co, if you have a Rotom on your team, you can take this elevator to another floor and change its forms. The Fighting Dojo is also in town, and this is where you can rematch any gym leaders. Sabrina surprisingly only had three team members, so she wasn't too tough to take down. After heading left through the very small Route 7, we reached Celadon City. If you're playing at night, you can go to the roof of the Celadon condominiums and listen to this guy's scary story. In reality, he was just describing a kid who tried to bike up the cycling road, but as a reward for listening, he gave us the spell tag. Maylene also made a surprise appearance in town, but she was only there for an eating contest at the local cafe. As for Erica, her team of grass types were nothing special. Over on Route 16, we found this hidden house where this man said that polyphenol is a trendy saying. Yeah, I don't even think I pronounced that right. Janine is one of the two new gym leaders to Kanto in these games, as Koga is now a part of the Elite Four. She still used poison types though, and my team had no difficulty beating her. While making the long trek to Lavender Town, we saw Suicune again on Route 14, and this is the second to last time we'll be seeing it. Lavender Town kicks off the small side plot in the post game, as the power plant is shut down, meaning the radio is off air and the power is out across the region. By working our way through the much less annoying rock tunnel, we got to Route 10 and checked out the power plant. It turns out some guy stole a part to the machine, so of course, we were asked to retrieve it. In Cerulean City, we learned that it was actually a Team Rocket Grunt that stole the machine part. After defeating him in a battle on the Nugget Bridge, we found the stolen part by these inflatable tubes in the gym and took it back to the power plant. As a reward, we received the TM for Zap Cannon, and the rest of Kanto is now opened up. But we still had some unfinished business by Cerulean City, including crashing Misty's date at the Cerulean Cape and taking down her water types for another gym badge. Now that the power was back on, there was a couple of things for us to do. We talked to the copycat girl in Saffron City, and she said she lost a Pokedoll over in the Pokemon fan club. After grabbing the lost item and leaving the building, Steven showed up from the Hoenn region. 
He was here to tell us that Latias, or Latios if you're playing Soul Silver, is currently roaming Kanto. I decided to hold that off until later, so for now, I gave the Pokedoll back to the copycat girl, and she handed us a pass that allowed us to use the Magnet Train to travel in between Goldenrod and Saffron City. Lastly, I grabbed the EXPN card back in the radio tower, which gave us the ability to play the Poke Flute so that we could take down the Snorlax blocking Diglett's cave. The cave led us straight to Pewter City, where Brock's team got taken out by some leaves. Before leaving the city, I talked to this man, who randomly gave us the Silver Wing, or Rainbow Wing in Soul Silver. This now gives us the chance to catch Lugia later on. For now, I checked out Mount Moon, but as we headed inside, our rival ambushed us. I feel like this rival battle is forgotten about a lot of the time, since you don't even have to come to Mount Moon in the post game. Another cool feature about this area is the Mount Moon Square. Along with a little shop, if you come here during 8pm on a Monday and 4am on a Tuesday, there will be a group of Clefairy dancing around the pond. Once they get scared and leave, they will leave behind a Moonstone for you. While heading south of Pewter City, we came across the Trainer House in Viridian City. This is a building where you can battle other people, or just NPCs, in fixed battles, where all of your Pokemon are level 50. If you win the fight, then you'll receive some battle points. Pallet Town didn't really have much to offer at this moment, so I went straight to Blaine, who is located east of Cinnabar Island now, thanks to a volcanic eruption. After washing away his fire types, I made my way through the Seafoam Islands and came face to face with Articuno in order to catch the first legendary bird. Now that we had all seven gym badges, I talked to Blue on Cinnabar Island, and he deemed us worthy enough to challenge him back in Viridian City. Blue is the second new gym leader in Kanto, and he's by far the most difficult. After knocking out his diverse team, Professor Oak gave us a call. He wanted to congratulate us for obtaining all eight gym badges in Kanto by handing us the HM for Rock Climb, which we'll need as he also granted us access to Mount Silver. While we could go challenge Red right now, I wanted to take care of some legendaries first. These included Zapdos outside the power plant, Moltres in Mount Silver, and Mewtwo in the Cerulean Cave. Now as you probably know, Red sits at the top of Mount Silver, and he is one of the strongest trainers out of any Pokemon game. So I decided to spam my team with the rare candies. I mean, come on, what else was I gonna do? It still was a hard battle, but in the end I took the title of the strongest trainer, and Red was left speechless. Now even though that was the last trainer battle to do in the post game, there was still plenty of things we could do. Beginning with going back to Professor Oak's lab, where he gave us the choice of receiving a Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle. Of course, I went with my boy Squirtle, before heading back to the Sylph Co, where Steven offered us one of the three Hoenn starters. I chose Mudkip to keep the water trend going, before following Steven to the Pewter Museum. By talking to him there, he went back to the Sylph Co, where we had the option to do a trade with him. He was looking for a fortress though, so I was unable to get his Beldum. The final stretch of events in the postgame involved more legendaries. First off, I headed back to the Cerulean Cape, where Suicune was waiting for a battle. Yusin witnessed me catch it firsthand, and decided that I was the trainer meant for Suicune. I then ran between Lavender Town and Route 8 a bunch, until Latias ended up in the same route. So, it was finally time to use my Master Ball. The last two legendaries required me to backtrack to Johto, starting with Lugia. Since we got the Silver Wing from the man in Pewter City, Lugia was just waiting for us in the Whirl Islands. Over on Route 30, Mr. Pokemon was so impressed that I got both Ho-Oh and Lugia, 
that he gave me the blue orb or red orb if you're playing soul silver with this item in hand i trekked to a secluded area of route 47 known as the embedded tower and caught the beast of the ocean now unfortunately i don't have any way of trading for a groudon but if i did then I could have shown Professor Oak the two box art legends of Generation 3 in order to receive the Jade Orb, which would allow me to go back to the Embedded Tower and catch Rayquaza. And with that, we have done just about all there is to do in the postgame of Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Of course, I could try to take on the Battle Frontier or complete the National Dex but those are two other completely different journeys. This postgame is definitely my favorite, not only because of nostalgia, but also because you get to check out a whole nother region. Will we ever get another postgame where you explore a different region? Who knows? I had a lot of fun making this video, and hopefully you guys enjoyed it just as much. For now though, have a great rest of your day, and until next time, deuces!